And thank you for joining us today. We're started in a couple of minutes. Samantha, just testing my mic here. I can hear you, Eric. Thank you. Hi, this is Eric Steltzer, uh, Director of DOER, Division of Renewable Energy. We'll just give it a couple more minutes just in case there's some stragglers and then get going. Okay, great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started here. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for uh, attending today's uh, Smart Emergency Regulations uh, virtual tutorial. Um, uh, this is Eric Stelzer, the Director of the Renewable Energy Division at uh, Department of Energy Resources. 
will also be I'll also be co-presenting with uh, Caitlin Kelly, uh, who will will uh, talk about a few of the slides as well. Um, so first off, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody that um, of what you are doing here in the Commonwealth to keep the clean energy moving forward. Um, you know, without you, uh, uh, it, we wouldn't be uh, achieving some of our, our goals here. So thanks for everyone's uh, work that they're doing in, in these uh, tough times. Um, and I certainly hope that everybody is, is staying safe and healthy at their homes. Um, I briefly just want to, to go over the purpose of today's meeting and what we'll, the intent of the meeting is uh, uh, versus um, uh, what it's not supposed to be. And so today's meeting is really aimed for us to provide uh, further information to you all about aspects of the regulations. We're not intending to capture all aspects of the regulations, but um, certainly we've been hearing a number of questions that have been coming in. Uh, uh, from folks, and so it's it's really aimed to help to uh, provide uh, further information just on on the regulations and where they're at. Uh, we certainly are able to answer high level questions about the regulations, um, but uh, certainly the meet this 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 meeting isn't meant to go into specific guidance on any sort of uh, specific projects. Uh, we're not intending to have any conversations about uh, policy implications and the policy goals of, of what we've chosen to do here. Um, and the appropriate avenue for you to provide us those feedback is through the public comment process. Um, to that uh, point, you know, we do have the public hearing that is going to be on Friday, May 22nd. Uh, and that is also the deadline for when public uh, comments, written public comments are due as well. As we're going through this, uh, I, I did just want to flag, we will have time at the end for questions. We will uh, take written questions in first. Um, and the best way to do that is uh, in GoToWebinar, there is a little box off on the right-hand side that says questions. And you can uh, hit the arrow there to, to uh, put a drop down. And in there, you can send uh, private questions to the organizers. And so as we're going through the slides, if there is a question that you'd have, I'd ask that you provide that to us in writing, and then we can uh, proceed forward through those questions. Um, then as time allows, you will certainly open it up to uh, people to raise their hands um, um, for questions as well. And so Caitlin will be uh, facilitating that in, uh, in, uh, towards the tail end. Just waiting for it to progress. Hold on one second. Samantha, I'm not up. Oh, there we go. Great. I'll try it again, but let's let's uh, I might have some difficulties with advancing slides here. So timeline. Just so, so I want to run through this just so everybody's uh, very clear on the process of what we're looking at. As, as folks know, we did file these regulations with the Secretary of State on an emergency basis on the 14th of April. Uh, those regulations were took a effect on the 15th, uh, which is the publication date, uh, which is a, a defined term in our emergency regulations. Um, and uh, uh, the port on the 15th, the portal did close down uh, for new applications, uh, continuing to accept any sort of change requests uh, to existing applications, but the portal was closed for new applications. We're holding this public tutorial today. Uh, and then uh, the next date that's coming up is on, on Monday, the 18th. On that date, we anticipate the portal uh, to go live. Um, and on that date, we're, we're, as we noted earlier in our announcement, there are additional guidelines that are necessary to implement the emergency regulations. And we anticipate releasing a further uh, grouping of those guidelines on, on Monday as well. On the 22nd, we have the virtual public hearing, um, um, as well as the public written comments that I've mentioned is due. Then uh, on the 18th of June, um, that's the next date that we anticipate further public comments on the additional guidelines that would be issued out on Monday to allow a 30-day uh, comment period on those as well. And then uh, finally, the regulations uh, would be uh, filed with Secretary of State and promulgated on the 14th of July. 
Now I'll just go through uh, slide by slide just on the uh, aspects of the regulations that I, I want to, to call a little bit of attention about. And, and hopefully this will address uh, uh, new, numerous questions that people have been posing to us. So the first one here is the definition of important farmlands. Um, this was in the straw proposal. Um, and it, in essence, it expands uh, protection of farmlands and, and expands the opportunities for dual use before it was uh, just prime farmlands and now using the important agricultural farmlands, this is including it to include unique farmlands as well as additional land of statewide importance. Low income. Um, low income, this was in our uh, straw proposal as well in that we expanded the definition to include low income eligible areas. Uh, people have noted that the definition here is slightly different than what we had in the straw proposal, but the intent of it is still the same. Um, this, this new, the, the, the revised uh, 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 emergency regulations and this new definition does align to environmental justice communities policies and how they define low income areas. And, and so to uh, identify those neighborhoods that uh, are determined to be a low income eligible area, you can utilize the EJ uh, tool um, and, though, and, and they will align to one another. Um, we are working, on, as I mentioned, we are working on low income guidelines that are stated in the regulations and we anticipate that those would be released on Monday. Um, and in those uh, guidelines, we would have a link to the uh, EJ portal as well to define those areas. Next is on public entity. Um, this uh, uh, was not in the straw proposal. Um, and what we've done on this is to expand the definition of, of public entity to allow projects that are sited on private land um, and then that project is either owned or operated by the municipality or the 100% uh, uh, of the output is going to the municipality or government entity in which the private land is located in. Um, so you certainly couldn't have a situation where you have a project that is in the western part of Massachusetts on private land and selling their power to a town that's in the eastern area. This is specifically confining it to private land only within that municipality. The other aspect I want to touch on that, that there was some questions on was uh, other government entity and people noted that we uh, uh, struck the provision state or local entity. We struck this largely as a technical correction. Um, if you go to DPU's uh, uh, net metering regulations there, there are some uh, government entities that aren't state or local that uh, do participate. Um, um, through those provisions. And so we didn't want to exclude those few instances where that is occurring. Program expansion. Um, this was uh, 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 revised from our straw proposal. As many have noted, we have increased the capacity, doubled the capacity to, uh, uh, to 3,200 megawatts. Um, and uh, uh, we did add in a provision here to use newer load data. Um, and so in the guidelines on capacity blocks, uh, we have noted in there the uh, new load that we have done. So it did uh, minor tweaks, but uh, did that, 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 that was the intent of this uh, change that we did here. We also noted that it is going from eight blocks to 16 blocks as well. We also added in a set aside for mid-sized projects. Uh, this was not in the straw proposal. Um, and we highlighted that this is starting in the first full capacity block after the publication date. And so this isn't just uh, the expanded capacity, but it is existing capacity um, of when this carve out would uh, start. And, and this is noted in the um, guideline on the capacity blocks as well. We also have included a set aside for low income. This was not in the straw proposal. Um, it's uh, set at 5% uh, for the capacity within that block. 
Um, it's noted in the guidelines for capacity blocks about how much uh, capacity is allocated into low income. Um, and this one likewise uh, took effect with the first full capacity block after the uh, publication date. So um, uh, for Eversource Yeast, this does go into effect uh, for some of the existing capacity that is there. One thing that I will note, and we will clarify this in the guideline uh, for low income, that there is uh, a potential that a project could be included as a set aside for a low income uh, capacity, as well as a set aside for a mid-sized capacity. And in those instances where there, a project does span both of those um, uh, set asides, the applicant will be able to choose which block they would like to be attributed to. So if there is a, a differentiation in the rate of plot block progression for those projects, um, the applicant could choose uh, which one they would prefer to, to, to be in. Eversource merger, this was also in the straw proposal and was required by us um, through uh, the, the tariff filing in that it merged the capacity for Eversource East and Eversource West. Um, however, the compensation rates um, were maintained uh, for the different uh, uh, distribution areas. Land use. So uh, there's a, a few slides here that we'll go into on land use now. Um, the first section here, I just want to note uh, that this that that is highlighted. What this is clearly stating is that the land use provisions um, for the old regulations apply to projects that have statement of qualifications. And as you'll note in our statement of qualification guideline, we highlight that any project that has submitted a statement of qual submitted an application prior to the publication date, but has not been yet issued out a statement of qualification, at our discretion, we would be looking at applying the um, old regulations to those. So that's how we're handling that little bit of a nuance there. But the key thing here is that 1A here is applying the old regulations to um, those who have received statement of qualifications prior to publication date. The sec second piece here is firmly establishing the rule of the new land use provisions for post-publication. And we'll go into those key pieces, but I just want to be clear that going forward after the publication date, this those provisions that are underneath 5E7 are the rules for the regulations going forward. The last section here, it pertains to the exceptions to um, um, the uh, new land use changes that we have done. And in essence, this is the grandfathering provision. And so it does allow any project that has um, uh, in essence has site control as well as uh, uh, non-ministerial permits um, prior to the publication date as well as the interconnection service agreement uh, within six months of the publication date uh, that they would have the old regulations uh, for land use applied to them. And I'll go into that in a little bit when we get to that section. Next on uh, category one agriculture, um, I wanted to highlight the, the change here for important uh, from prime to important. Um, this, is, this is important for lack of a better term because it is in essence providing uh, uh, and expanding the opportunity for dual agriculture uh, to apply on a greater number of, uh, of land use types within the state. Okay, so now here comes the piece on the new provisions for land use. Um, the first piece here 
is that we're this was in the pub in the straw proposal from the fall and in, in in essence we are moving the any sort of public entity solar tariff generation unit uh into category one um notably that by it being in category one the new elements of land use do not apply they only apply to uh, category two and category three projects. Number two is was also in the straw proposal, and this firmly establishes that any project that is in a solar overlay district would now be considered as a category two land use type. And by being a category two, it is subject to the new land use provisions as well as uh, uh, the greenfield subtractor. The last section here is the new areas for ineligible land use types. And this was not in the straw proposal. Um, in this section, we have continued the ineligible land use types such as wetlands, but it has been expanded as well to include um, number two and number three there, which are different. And I'll walk through an examples of that. But number two, it pertains to, I'll, I'll note the word uh, on land designated as priority habitat. So any area that has been designated specifically as that type is, um, uh, uh, and that is category two and category three, would be prohibited uh, if it were seeking to be participating in the SMART program. Number three is different because what it's saying is that a parcel, a tax parcel, has 50% or more of its area designated as priority habitat or core habitat or critical natural landscape, that that entire parcel then would be uh, prohibited from um, uh, participating uh, in the SMART program. We did create a GIS tool. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll step back. I want to get the grandfather exception. So as I noted earlier, underneath the grandfathering provision, uh, this is basically all of the areas that are eligible for an exception then if you meet the criteria for the exception, which again are if you have site control and non-ministerial permits prior to the publication date, as well as the ISA within six months of the publication date, then you could uh, receive an exception for these criteria. I will get to Greenfield Subtractor in a moment um, um, on how we handled that exception, but um, um, I wanted to note that this is the specific area where the grandfathering is getting uh, uh, exception and how it's being applied. Now I'll get to the land use tool. As, as some of you have seen, um, we have created a, a land use tool in order to help uh, the public identify and understand how these new ineligible land use types for priority habitat, core habitat, and critical natural landscape are applying to project, projects. The website is uh, provided there on the bottom left of, of the screen. And I thought I'd just walk through an example here. So here in this screen, you'll see several different colors. The, the yellowish color is the Article 97 land. The green color encompasses um, any area that, uh, any land that has been designated as priority habitat, core habitat, or critical natural landscape. And then the gray areas denote um, blocks that meet the 50% threshold. So let's look at specific examples here to this then. On this parcel here, you'll note that sections of it um, uh, are white. And those sections that are white is where um, solar development could occur within that parcel and wouldn't be subject to these new ineligible land use types. I'll note that this website tool does not include all ineligible land use types, for example, wetlands, but it's really pertaining specifically to priority habitat, core habitat, and um, critical natural landscape. 
So this, where the solar couldn't be installed on this parcel in particular is the green areas and that little bit of a, a Article 97 land that's up in the top left hand. On this next parcel, you'll see, and it's parcel number 26636, you'll see that not all of the parcel is within an air, has land that is within a, um, a uh, within a priority habitat, core habitat, or critical natural landscape. Um, and that some of the parcel there is just in this shaded gray color. This means that that entire parcel, even that little bit that sticks up at the top, would be prohibited from having solar be installed on it and still participating in the SMART program because it met the second threshold that more than 50% of the parcel area had uh, uh, um, the core habitat, priority habitat, or critical natural landscape. And with that, I think I will turn it now over to Caitlin to go through the remaining slide pieces uh, and start with energy storage. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, so first, I want to go over the new energy storage requirement um, for projects greater than 500 kW that are applying for a statement of qualification. This was something that we did include in the straw proposal. Um, we have some further clarifications for this requirement in the regs as published on April 15th. So first, we do have some exceptions to this requirement. Um, we do offer an exception for projects that are applying that have all of their required documentation, so site control, non-ministerial permits, and ISA by the publication date, by April 15th. And this is a slightly different grandfathering exception from um, the exception we have established for the land use requirements, so I just, just do want to point that out. So to be exempted from the energy storage requirement, you also have to have your ISA by April 15th. VUER will also have a good cause exception uh, process set up for this requirement. Um, so a project can uh, submit a request to DOER to be exempt from, from this requirement for good cause, and we will make a determination on a case-by-case -case basis. To clarify how this requirement uh, will apply to existing and new projects being submitted um, that have energy storage. So if um, a project is currently operational, or has already been issued an SOQ with battery storage, if during the tariff term they, you know, the battery reaches the end of its life, they may choose not to replace the battery and they would just simply drop the energy storage adder. However, if a project uh, is submitting an application after the publication date and so is subject to this requirement, if during the tariff term the battery reaches the end of its serviceable life, the battery must be replaced to remain compliant um, with this requirement. So just some distinction there. Next, I'm going to go over a couple of the updates we've made to low-income community shared solar and community shared solar projects. Um, let me just go back. So just going over some of the general requirements for low-income and community shared solar. Um, so just a reminder, no more than two participants can receive bill credits in excess of those produced annually by 25 kW. And the combined share of those participants shall not exceed 50%. So it, uh, colloquially, this is referred to essentially as the anchor off takers and anchor tenants as um, in a community shared project. This is something that's been a requirement since community shared solar was started under SREC 2. Um, a new exception that we've uh, created for community shared solar projects is that those anchor tenants will not be required to um, submit a customer disclosure form. So under the SMART program, as we know, all off-takers in community shared solar projects have to have signed a customer disclosure form. Um, so we did, we did make that change that 
we will no longer require those um, customer disclosure forms for the customers that are essentially receiving a much larger share of the energy from the project. Um, the third change is something that it, this isn't new, but DOER is, has instead uh, formally written into the rules, um, something that we have been in, that has been in place again since we were reviewing and approving community shared solar projects in SREC 2. And that rule is that um, the customers in a community shared solar project must be distinct legal entities. So all of your off takers have to be distinct legal entities. What this means is that if you have a town, for instance, um, even if you have the firehouse and the town hall and the library as off takers in a, in a community shared solar project, while they are different utility accounts, we will consider that energy that's being allocated as what's being allocated to a single customer. If you have um, restaurants that are franchised, however, and each restaurant is franchised as a different LLC, then in that instance, we may have a number of Dunkin' Donuts that are distinct and different customers in a community shared solar project. Um, so essentially the rules of how much energy those customers can be allocated um, is distinguished by customer rather than utility account. And then finally, we this also was from the straw proposal, um, essentially saying that uh, electricity or bill credits and community shared solar projects can be run through a municipal load aggregation program, um, or we will allow low income community shared solar projects um, run through projects programs administered by the EDCs. Um, the next change we made to low-income community shared solar and community shared solar is essentially requiring that 90% of the bill credits or the, the capacity amount for a project that we require to remain com consistent and compliant with the adder eligibility if a project applies for this adder at its preliminary statement of qualification, it does have to show that it has all those customers lined up um, by the time it is operational and is submitting a claim. So, sorry, just working through some of the slides here. Um, so if a project isn't able to demonstrate that it has had uh, obtain all of its customers by the time it's submitting a claim, um, it may be, it will be subject to losing its position in the queue um, and being put in the back of the queue. So it's not that it will lose a statement of qualification per se, but it'll lose its um, queue position and block position. So for community shared solar projects, we're going to offer uh, a 60 day grace period. And what the 60 day grace period will do is it's going to allow projects to drop that adder if, if they, for instance, they feel like they will not be able to have all of their off takers by the time they submit the claim. Um, and it will be able to do so uh, without being subjected to that essentially punishment by being moved to the back of the queue. Um, and during this, when we offer this grace period, depending on how much capacity is dropped by projects at that point, um, you know, we may do a one-time reshuffling of the allocations in the community shared solar queue. So if enough capacity is dropped, a project um, may move actually move up in their community shared solar adder rate if they are able to move up in a tranche in that adder. Um, another provision that we are instituting, and again, this was um, in the straw proposal from last fall, is that all projects that are serving low-income customers um, must show that those customers will receive a net savings um, by enrolling in the solar contract. So again, we're going to be detailing how um, applicants can demonstrate this um, to us in the guideline 
um, that we will be putting out next week. Um, another change that we're making that was proposed in the strat proposal is we are going to allow public entity solar tariff generation units to apply for a statement of qualification uh, earlier in the development process. So uh, public entity projects uh, may submit an application for an SOQ um, when a municipality or government entity has awarded a contract. And the application of this means uh, it's not that you have to wait for a contract to be signed, but once a, a developer has been selected through an RFP process um, for a project that a municipality or government entity is running, once they've been given the award through the RFP, at that point in time, you can submit an application for an SOQ. So again, um, the, consumer, the new consumer protection provisions we're going to be implementing. Um, further details on this process will be in the, the guideline on consumer protection. Um, but effectively, we are going to be uh, periodically auditing the contract and the customer disclosure forms that are submitted to us um, as part of the statement of qualification application. And if we identify inconsistencies, if we identify material defects in the information provided, then we will be issuing warnings to applicants. And if uh, an applicant receives three warnings, then they will be prohibited from submitting applications for a year. Um, so again, like I said, really more of the details for this process um, will be forthcoming in the guideline um, information on what constitutes um, what what will constitute a warning um, will we be will those warnings continually accrue um, things like that so those details are forthcoming um, so again just another clarification on possible exceptions and exemptions from the customer disclosure form requirement. Um, so if an applicant can demonstrate to us that the uh, LACSS or CSS project um, is being operated uh, without customer contracts, um, then they will not be required to submit to customer disclosure forms. So uh, for instance, if a community solar project or LICSS is run through an EDC program, we wouldn't expect uh, any customer contracts to be included, customer disclosure forms wouldn't be necessary. Or for instance, if um, an applicant is working directly with uh, a housing authority to provide benefits to its residents, then again, there wouldn't be direct customer contracts. So if, if there's no contract, there's no need to provide the customer disclosure form. So this is the compensation decline, um, something that we touched on in the straw proposal from last fall. So as you know, the original eight blocks in the SMART, the SMART program declined at a rate of 4% per capacity block, um, slight variations with the Inchel and Nantucket service territories. So we are proposing and we are implementing a change to that. So starting with the next open block um, in each service territory, behind the meter project will have their base compensation rates decline um, by 2%, um, and standalone projects will have their base compensation rates decline by 4%, continuing the rate of decline that's been established. Again, from the straw proposal, we're creating a new adder um, for projects that are certified through the University of Massachusetts Clean Energy Extension's Pollinator Friendly Certification Program. Um, so, 
it's a certification program that the UMass Clean Energy Extension has put together um, about how projects can plant pollinators on ground mounted projects. Um, this is an adder that is open to all projects. So obviously new systems that are applying through the SQA, um, you know, when it opens up again next week can apply for this. But also if existing projects or even projects that have been operational, if they decide to go through the certification process um, to be a pollinator friendly project, um, they can be eligible for this adder. So this goes along um, with a number of the land use changes that uh, Eric went over earlier um, in the earlier slides. Essentially, we, we did increase the Greenfield tractor um, by a factor of two and a half for the category two and category three land use projects. Um, so if a project is uh, determined to be in category two or category three, um, they will continue to be subject to a greenfield subtractor, um, and it will depend on how you're classified uh, under the old rules or the existing rules um, to determine whether or not you receive this uh, new increased greenfield subtractor for your project. There's no change that we're making in terms of how we're calculating the greenfield subtractor. So that will continue to be calculated based on the total square footage of the panels installed on the site. So again, this is just to clarify which projects are subject to the new increased um, greenfield subtractor. So we are working off of that publication date and the grandfathering um, exceptions that we have in place to determine who is subject to the increased greenfield subtractor and who is subject to the old green field detractors. So again, this is just going through um, what the exceptions are for if you are subject to the higher green field detractors that we have now implemented or the old green field detractors um, that were existing. Okay, um, behind the meter incentive calculation, I know we've gotten a lot of questions on this. So this part of the regulation is the calculation for the incentive for behind the meter project as currently exists. Um, one of the, really, one of the only changes we made to this section of the reg is if you look at the main body of the calculation, you'll see that we have eliminated the provision as of the generation unit's commercial operation date. The reason behind this change is to clarify a practice that we already have in place. Um, the intent of calculating the incentive for behind the meter project is that we use obviously um, current current volumetric charges, so the current distribution, transmission, and transition charge, um, and the three-year average of basic service. And we realized that in the language of that paragraph, um, it, there was some slightly conflicting language because the intent was that once you are issued a preliminary statement of qualification, that is the incentive calculation that would apply to your project going forward and that you could count on that calculation. Um, so we that has been our practice in place. And really the elimination of that part of the reg uh, as of the commercial operation date, that was just to clarify that even if your commercial operation date is in a different year from the date, that, the year that you're issued the preliminary statement of qualification, the incentive calculation would stay the same um, and it would not change. And this section is the new behind the meter incentive calculation. So I know this section um, has 
created a, a lot of confusion and people have a lot of questions about who exactly is eligible for this new calculation. Um, when will it be, be implemented? So to walk through when projects will begin receiving calculations um, with this new incentive calculation and also who is eligible for it, uh, the intent of the, our intent in the way that we wrote it is, it's intended to apply to projects that submit an application after the publication date. So if you have submitted any application prior to the publication date, the old method of calculating the incentive for behind the meter projects will apply. If you submit an application after the publication date and you are also not receiving net metering as a behind the meter project, this you are eligible to have your incentive calculated using this new formula. If you submit an application after the publication date and you are behind the meter but are receiving net metering credits, then you will have your incentive calculated using the old incentive calculation. This incentive calculation for behind the meter projects is embedded in the tariff itself. So because of that, this new secondary formula will have to be approved by the DPU before any payments can be made based on this calculation. Because of that, DOER will not be issuing any preliminary statements of qualification with this new formula until a tariff has been approved by the DPU of this new formula. But we will apply the eligibility um, in the way that I have described. So a project may be issued a preliminary statement of qualification with the old calculation, even if they are eligible for the new calculation. And then once we have uh, approval by the DPU on the new formula, you know, we may, we'll likely go back and reissue um, the incentive calculation and the new SOQ. I do want to clarify what this, what this applies to and what this doesn't apply to. This new formula, it's not, it does not have any impact on the actual extension of the AOBC to behind the meter projects. The AOBC as a tool lies firmly within the tariff itself. So the extension of uh, AOBC to behind the meter uh, is not yet effective. Um, it, that absolutely has to be reviewed and approved by the DPU. And also, which projects may be eligible as behind the meter projects for AOBC is also something that will have to be reviewed and approved by the DPU. So this section of the reg is a section that applies only to the calculation of the incentive. It does take into consideration what type of energy compensation um, a project may receive, but it does not actually react in its incentive calculation to any energy credit that the project is receiving. Just like how we've always calculated these behind the meter incentives, um, it's not actually taking into account the total amount a project may receive in net metering credits. The formula is meant to approximate what energy compensation they're actually receiving. So I know that that is, um, you know, it's, it's a little confusing um, in terms of what this applies to, what changes are currently in effect. The change to the formula is in effect, but since this formula itself is embedded in the tariff, then it projects can't be paid under this new incentive calculation until that new formula has also been approved by the tariff. So with that into consideration, GOER is making the choice to not issue any SOQs with this new incentive calculation yet. 
So now we go to questions. Okay. Just one second. All right. Okay. So I'll just start at the top. Um, we have a question on the metering guideline um, that addresses proposed changes to the reg. Um, so DOER is going to be issuing a guideline on metering next week. Um, so I think any details um, on, you know, technical details on metering will be included in that guideline, but um, that will be forthcoming and will be accepted comments on them. Um, we have a question on the export compensation rate for behind the meter AOBC project. So again, the actual energy rate for export um, is something that will have to be approved by the DPU. Um, we've obviously, we discussed the AOBC currently exists as the basic service rate. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that's how it currently exists. You can use that as a reference for what may be extended to behind the meter, but any specifics will have to be discussed and approved by the DPO. Um, so we have a question on how community solar might work with municipal aggregation. Um, so I think we forthcoming details on how that might work are coming in the guideline that we're going to be issuing. So um, I think we'll, you know, hopefully the guideline addresses any questions people have around that process. I know it's, it, it is different from how community solar has uh, historically been operated. Um, but you know, we certainly hope the guideline helps answer questions and maybe also start um, a discussion around how those how those systems might be worked. Uh, a couple of questions on the slides being posted available at the webinar. They will be they will be made available after that after the webinar is posted. So we had a question on when applications will be accepted through the portal under the new reg. So as Eric mentioned earlier um, at the beginning, the portal reopens um, next week on the 18th. And it honestly depends on your, your project specifically as to which set of rules you may or may not be subject to. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage you to review the grandfathering rules that we have currently established um, to see which rules you may be subject to. Uh, we are working this into the portal itself uh, to help, but essentially it depends on the project to see which, you know, which set of rules you might, might apply to your project. Um, oh, we had a question on um, blocks and compensation rate declines for Unitil and Nantucket. Uh, we are finalizing those uh, right now, so we do expect them to be posted very shortly. Um, we have been working with the EDCs to finalize the exact rates of decline for the, um, those two service territories. Uh, we had a question to clarify what is meant by the publication date. So the, the publication date is the date that the 
regs were published. So the publication date is April 15th, 2020. And it that date is used to provide a demarcation um, in terms of which set of rules applies to which projects. So again, um, to, you know, to really get into the details of that, there are, you know, a grandfathering exceptions um, for different sorts of changes. So again, we encourage you to really look at your project, look at the, the which set of rules it may apply to, because we have um, slightly, slightly different uh, grandfathering exceptions for different changes. Um, but effectively, new changes are effective after April 15th. Um, a question weathering, uh, asking whether a site in Eversource West and Eversource East, um, a site in West can have off takers in Eversource East with this merger. So I, I think that'll be clarified in the DP, at the DPU, uh, because in the tariff, it does specifically say that you cannot allocate credits across those two service territories. So the merger, um, from DOER's perspective is it's for the capacity blocks, um, and it, it's not a merger of and have any impact on the eligibility of allocating net metering or AOBC credits. Um, we've had a number of questions around the presentation and um, this webinar. So we are recording this webinar and a link will be made available um, after, after this is finished. Okay. So we're getting a number of project specific questions around how to apply the um, the grandfathering rules for land use. Um, so if you have projects with the questions, um, I would encourage you just to email the OER with those directly. Um, and just if you have a question around how it may, how it might apply, you know, to whatever conditions, uh, are in your, pro are in your project site. I had a question again about the energy storage requirement. Um, so just to clarify, the only exceptions to that requirement are if you have all of your required documentation by April 15th, um, or you're able to obtain good cause. So if you currently have a project that's being studied by the EDC, but you haven't been issued an ISA, then you would be subject to that requirement, um, unless you are granted uh, an exception for good cause by the DOER. Um, so again, I've gotten a couple questions around possible good cause exceptions. I can't speak to any 
any possible scenarios that DOER may grant good cause exceptions um, for the energy storage requirement, um, you know, you'll, we'll have to make that determination on a case by case basis um, based on the project uh, details and the project facts as they're presented to us. Um, clarification on the merger for Eversource West and East um, about when that goes into effect. So that that does go into effect after um, after Block Eight for Eversource East. So essentially, the way it, it will work is, you know, we we can't open up the expanded capacity blocks until they've been approved by the DPO. So in the meantime, Eversource East still has space available. Those blocks will continue to proceed and accept applications, issue SOQs. Once the project is, um, once the project, once the expanded capacity is available at two new applications, then what we'll do is the the expanded capacity block nine, the combined block, will be available immediately to projects currently in Eversource West, but Eversource East projects will continue to move through the original eight blocks um, until they reach block eight, and then at that time, they'll be applying to the expanded capacity combined block nine. Okay, um, so we have a question on, Eric, um, maybe you want to take this. If a project has received its SOQ and secures a public off-taker for 100% of the capacity, can it now um, add the public off-taker for the higher adder amount, um, or will it need to withdraw and submit? Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Um, I think I, it came up in a few other questions as well. So if a project has been issued a statement of qualification prior to the publication date, the old regulations will apply. And that includes the public entity adder at uh, the two cents rate. So to the extent that that project would choose to, any project can choose to withdraw. And so to the extent that they would like to withdraw that application, and then reapply in order to have the to be applied underneath the new regulations and have the four cent adder applied to it. It can choose to do that. Um, if it were to do that, it does lose its block location of where it was issued a, uh, a block allocation underneath its um, uh, statement of qualification. Okay. Um, we have another question on if an SDGU meets the grandfathering land use criteria and is over 500, does it still need to include ESS? Um, so again, it may or it may not. Um, the ESS grandfathering clause um, is if you have all of your documents by April 15th. Um, so I think the clarification there is if you are grandfathered for the ESS requirement, then you do fall under the land use grandfathering requirements. If you're grandfathered for land use, you may or may not be grandfathered for battery storage. Um, Eric, do you want to clarify on when the 2% decline for behind the meter starts? Yeah, that question has come up uh, prior to the tutorial as well as in the tutorial. So let me just make sure that everybody is very clear on this. The regulations specifically state that DOER can determine through its guideline 
when the 2% decline would begin for behind the meter systems. And so in the guideline for capacity blocks, we have indicated that that 2% decline begins and will only begin in expanded capacity. And so at least for national grid, for example, that would be in block eight to block nine. Um, so again, the 2% decline is only for expanded capacity. Okay. Okay. And then we've had a number of questions on um, if a project is, you know, perhaps it's, it's submitted an application on private land has a public entity as the host customer and are are they classified as category one um, despite the land being located on private land so eric you want to clarify that one yeah i'll clarify that so the there's a couple conditions that would have to be met number one is that that private land would have to be located within the municipality in which it's receiving the offtake agreement or the municipality itself or government entity would be owning and operating the solar facility on the uh that is located on a private land okay Um, so again, just some clarification on the new land use grandfathering provisions um, and grain fields of tractors. So uh, just if you have a project that was has submitted a complete application prior to 415, um, so if you have site control, non-material permits, ISAs, um, you are subject to the old subtractors and the old rules. So again, just a slight variation, I think, on a similar question. Um, so if you have submitted an application prior to the publication date, um, if you haven't received their SOQ, um, but if you have, if you submit an application prior to the publication date, um, if that application is complete, then they are subject to the old rule. So it, all of your required documentation, um, you know, is subject is dated prior to 415, then the old rules apply. Um, if your application is incomplete, um, you'll, you may or may not be subject to, you may be subject to some of the old rules, but some of the new rules. So again, when we launch next week with the new, with the portal, um, we are putting in steps in the application process to help applicants figure out which set of rules they may be applicable to and may be subject to. Um, so, but if you have more specific questions, um, you know, feel free to, to email DOER for any further clarification. Um, okay, so we have around um, 20 minutes left. Um, so why don't we move, we, we can also answer some questions um, directly if people can use the raise your hand function in the webinar. Um, so again, as a reminder, we are currently recording this webinar. Um, so your question will be recorded. We'll be posting the entire recording on our website afterwards. Um, but we are happy to answer some um, 
more questions if people want to raise their hands. Okay, sorry for that pause. I think we were having a little bit of technical difficulty there. So um, first person I see is uh, Ben uh, Suffren. So I'm going to unmute you now. Now, um, now, the floor. now. Ben, I'll come back to you. If you could work on the sound, um, that would be helpful. Uh, next person I'll try is uh, Joseph Hamill. Um, uh, Joseph, it looks like uh, you, you're you dialing out on a phone and I, I'm unable to unmute you. Um, okay, Joe, let's try it now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Perfect. Um, I had two questions. One is if you know when SOQs for waitlisted projects would be released. Yeah, to that first one is uh, on waitlisted projects, um, it's pending uh, tariff approval on the expanded capacity. And so we won't be issuing out any SOQs uh, until the tariff order has been approved. Okay, and that's, uh, I guess, expected around July based on the dates that were mentioned? Well, they need to get filed in the first instance, and then DP will need to adjudicate it. Um, so I don't have a uh, timing of when uh, DPU might issue out that order, um, but we are working uh, currently with the EDCs to get that tariff filing uh, submitted. Okay. And then the second question was if the um, if we're subject to the old rules based on the SOQ being prior to the publication date or uh, meeting those exceptions. Um, do we get the benefit of the expanded definition for low income? Yeah, we'll take a look at that and see how that applies and provide further clarification to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go back to Ben. Uh, one second. a lot of hands here. So um, looks like I'm just going to have to go in order here. Uh, Daniel Pertwee, I'm uh, going to unmute you and you have the floor. Hi, can you guys hear me? I do. Great. I had a couple questions. The, the first one was this, if, if the DOER was expecting to uh, release an updated BTM calculator uh, to provide additional certainty on the base compensation rates for each block in each service territory. Yeah, those are subject to the some inputs that are approved from the uh, utilities, and so we'll need to be working in concert with them on updating them and how those inputs apply to uh, going forward. So as as that does get worked out, yes, we will uh, uh, update that BTM calculator. My second question was whether uh, you can provide some additional clarity on the rationale or the basis for changing the uh, base compensation rate calculation. Like, what was the intention there? Yeah, right now it's not the, uh, our intent to go into intent on the policy. It's really to be uh, answering any sort of clarifying questions that people have to the regulations themselves. Okay, thanks. Uh, Courtney, uh, Philly Carp, uh, you're next. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thanks, Eric, and thank you guys for doing this. Um, as awkward as it is to all not be in the same room. Um, I had um, a, a couple of uh, questions. The first was, um, I think a really simple one. Will the disclosure form, I mean, the, the guideline on the disclosure form and CSS generally 
address some of the specific questions I know you guys have gotten specifically around things um, like signatures. So for instance, if you have um, two spouses and one spouse signs the CSS agreement, but the second spouse is actually the customer of record and some of those sort of you know nitpicky detail things um, as part of the updated form. Yeah, we are taking a look at the customer disclosure forms and updating them as appropriate. Okay, and then the other um, question was on the the public, the new public entity um, documentation requirement in terms of the documentation requirement for submission of an SQA being the quote unquote award. Um, will if a public entity has issued an award for a project, but that project doesn't yet have the documentation under 1C, you know, ISA permits and site control, is the award sufficient to exempt it from the new ESS requirement? Because that would be otherwise the documentation um, it would need to submit the SQA, even though it's not the documentation that's listed in that section. Yeah, no, the documentation that's required to forego the energy storage requirement in um, site control, non-ministerial permits, and ISA prior to the publication date or good cause. Even though that's not the documentation you need to submit the SQA? As I stated, that, that's pretty clear in the regulations that those are the three documents that are required in order to achieve the, um, uh, the uh, exception there. Okay, and then um, uh, the other question was um, for the behind the meter um, alternative bill credit um, projects, and I, I swear I know this is like everyone um, is so hard to do over the phone. When, in terms of the actual calculus credits, not just the formula, but is there anticipation that for that there monthly netting, like net metering? or will your credits be calculated based on sort of the interval of your meter over the course of the billing period as you're using power on site and or exporting? Yeah, I'll turn that over to Caitlin to see if uh, she has a response to that. Um, so I think the response to that is that that's gonna have to be something that's determined at the DPU because um, that's not something that the, the DOER regulations are that touches on it all, so that'll have to be um, addressed by the DPU. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, next person then is uh, Greg Geller. I'll unmute you. Go ahead, Greg. Yes, th thanks a lot for all this information. Uh, you might have just answered it, but I'm trying to understand, is DOER in these draft regs proposing to extend AOBC to behind the meter. I understand that it would have to be approved by DPU, but is, is that somewhere specific in these in these proposed regs? And, and if so, where is that? Yes, that is the intent. Um, and that is underneath 2008 uh, three. Thank you. Sure. Um, Next is uh, Kaviti, uh, excuse me, Kavita. You're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I had a question about um, whether the grandfathering rules um, could uh, apply to projects uh, that have recently been in the ASO studies but don't have their permits. Um, because being an ASO study is, was a deterrent to obtaining permits. So that's my first question. And then my other question is, um, are municipal projects, um, you know, are you, are you going to allow projects to have part of their output be part of a municipal adder and the other part be part of the CS adder? And do the municipalities have to be the same municipality um, as part of that? Yeah, um, sure. I can take the first question and then um, the second question. Maybe I'll turn it to Caitlin. Um, on the grandfathering precision for those projects that are in ASO study, to the extent that those uh, projects have um, site control and non-ministerial permits prior to the publication date, 
and then are awarded uh, an ISA um, um, within six months, then yes, those projects would be eligible for the grandfathering extension. But um, to the extent that either A, they're in the ASO study and they don't have non-ministerial permits or B, to the extent that they don't get their ISA within six months um, from the publication date, then they would not be eligible for the grandfathering. Um, and then Caitlin, I'll give it over to you for the municipal offtake um, portion of that um, piece. Yeah, and, and Kavita, I think if I understand your question, um, were you asking if a single project could effectively have some of their offtake go to municipality and some go to community solar and they would qualify for both is that is that was that the question yeah proportionally okay like, like one. um so is they uh, effectively no um they're you know they still remain as optager based adders so when we qualify a an SDGU, um, they can only be eligible for a single off taker based adder. Um, if you have multiple projects on a parcel and you're able to build multiple projects um, subject to our project segmentation rules, then it's possible you could have one go to um, a public entity and one be a community solar project, but we it, there would be no merging of the two. Thank you. And then my other, like the other part of my question was, could they serve, if you were exclusively municipal adder, could they serve different municipalities? Um, I think it would depend on which municipalities it served. Um, and what what type of land it was located on um, because we do have that provision that if it's on private land it has to be in the town that it's serving I mean, obviously if you have a single municipality with multiple accounts that you're serving that's that's a single off ticker um, you know if you are serving the entirety of the town's um, electricity service you're you have fire station, police station, library, town hall, um, you know, community community buildings, that's still a single off taker. So I think it, it would depend on the details of the project um, as to determine whether or not multiple, multiple municipalities could participate. Thank you, Caitlin. So just in response to Eric's response to my question, I just want to point out that when projects have gone into ASO studies, all permitting activity has been stopped because of the singular, potentially very high risk that the outcomes of those studies present. Um, so that was the purpose of my question to consider, to please consider the grandfathering of, of projects that have been in there without their permits. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, you can, anyone that has, uh, thoughts and directions of where the policy should go uh, is welcome to submit public comments um, to that account. Um, so next one uh, is Kevin Penders. I'll unmute you. You have the floor. Thanks, Eric uh, and Caitlin. Thank you both for the presentation. Um, I guess I just wanna clarify the question or the point you were raising on SOQs and SOQs um, when the portal reopens. I heard you say that um, you wouldn't be issuing SOQs until after the Department of Public Utilities uh, offers guidance on um, the tariffs that, that you're working with the EDCs to put that in front to put in front of them. Do you have a sense of the anticipated timeline you plan to ask from the DPU on that? I'm not aware of them having to address this with any time certain. So I'm just trying to think of um, how long it may be before SOQs start to be awarded. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and let me let me clarify pieces of that. You know, we can issue out statement of qualifications for existing capacity. Um, and as Caitlin mentioned, you know, for those projects that are behind the meter, we would be using the old calculation method um, until the DPU did make an approval. So there are elements of some SOQs that would be issued. 
the extent of timing on DPU, you know, we are we we're conscious of the desire for the industry to have the expanded capacity be opened up and to uh, begin um, having PSQs issued on those projects. So we are assessing, you know, uh, means in which we can progress that. Um, but I, I can't give any sort of specifics as far as uh, timing goes. Okay, thanks. Um, great, then the next one is, uh, um, and excuse me if I, I mispronounce your name, uh, Shade Jayule. You have, uh, you're muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, thank you for this. Um, my question was about community solar projects. Um, so I understand that um, community solar projects need to be 90% allocated by the incentive payment effective date uh, in order to avoid lose, uh, going back at the end of the queue. I wanted first to confirm, um, does that apply to um, projects who have received a preliminary um, statement of qualification before the publication date and are currently seeking uh, the adder first? And second, um, what do you mean by incentive payment effective date? Is it um, we need to be 90% allocated after COD or we have until uh, our deadline, our SOQ deadline to be 90% allocated? Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll hit the second question first. Payment incentive effective date um, is a defined term, and we also have uh, further guidelines uh, that are available on our website that go into further detail about payment incentive effective date. So I'd encourage you to take a look at those. Um, regarding, you know, whether the it'll the requirement pertains to those who already have a PSOQ. Um, I'll just note that it, you know, it's, it is on a case-by-case -case basis. What I, in particular, what I'm thinking of is to the extent that a CSS project um, um, chooses to implement uh, the 60-day provision there and remove the adder because they're not going to be achieved, they certainly wouldn't be in a later block, but however, and, and go to the end of the queue, so to say. However, to the extent that they maintain that CSS adder after the 60 days, um, and they have been issued a PSQ, then yeah, they are likely to uh, go to the end of the block if they're not able to achieve the 90% um, threshold by uh, payment incentive effective date. Okay, thanks. And um, if a project falls below 90% once during the 20 year term, um, so after we received a claim, um, then do we lose only the community soul adder or do we also go back at the end of the queue? for dual smart compensation? I think we need to take a look at those, uh, when those instances were to arise um, and uh, advise the applicant at that time. Okay, so, it, so it's not, there's no certainty on this yet? We can take a look at that. Um, I don't wanna, I, I, you know, it is a detailed question, so I just wanna take a look at it before I provided a specific, uh, um, specific answer to that, but I'm happy to do that. Okay. And just the last one, um, so currently we can submit um, only two Schedule Z or AOBC form to the utility, so twice a year. Um, is this limit uh, from the utilities and are there any plans to increase it in the future? Um, yeah, it's currently twice a year. Uh, you know, it could be altered at, at some other date. Um, but uh, currently it is at two years. I did just have uh, one of our, our uh, people just also took a look at that provision as far as whether it would just, uh, you know, I don't have the language right in front of me, so it's helpful that other team members are doing this on the fly to provide responsive answers. But on the adder being dropped, if, if to the extent that someone isn't able to meet that threshold, um, it would just be the adder that would be lost. They wouldn't go to uh, last queue position on the uh, block allocation. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Um, next, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to get to everyone, um, but uh, I'll turn it over to Ben Suffren. Ben, I'm gonna unmute you. You have the floor. Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, just a quick question on the, um, the process once the 60-day um, sort of Grace period is up, and and the you know potentially reshuffling of the tranche allocations. Can you kind of give a sense of of timing and when that will occur? 
that reshuffling process. And then also if you've already received your final SOQ um, and say it was, you know, you that, that had tranche for community solar, if you already started your incentive payment term um, after that reshuffling process, would uh, you be included in that reshuffling? Um, okay, let me answer the first one, and then um, then you might need to restate it again for the second one. Sorry, but the, when when the reshuffling will happen, um, we'll be looking to do that uh, shortly thereafter. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, as to specifically when that would happen, I, I can't uh, speak to that, but you know, it would certainly be very close. Um, uh, close to that that timeline and what's your what's your second question then um, yeah if we've already on the project received our final SOQ and started our incentive payment term um, and, and that included community solar uh, let's say tranche four and then after that reshuffling process occurs would, would that project that's already operating potentially you know shift up to tranche three I uh, got it okay um, I need to I, I need to give that a little bit of further thought to that on how that would apply and, and certainly speak internally. So I don't have an answer on that right off the top of my head, but um, can certainly take a look at that and at the very least make it very clear um, when we do do the reshuffling on on that position. That sounds good. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Uh, OK, great. Next is uh, Steve McDonough. You're unmuted, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, specific question about a project. Can a project on municipal land that has an ISA signed lease but without an off taker because the town itself did not have the capacity to take the off take, can that submit for an early SOQ? And we're not seeking the additional four cent public adder, obviously, in that case. So I just want to get your comments and thoughts on that. Well, the 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 guideline is or the regulations are very clear that the uh, ability to apply early is only available to public entity adder. So to the ex, uh, or public entity STGUs. So to the extent that um, you're not your project isn't meeting that uh, designation, um, then you would not be eligible for uh, applying early. And what if it's based on an award? Um, in does that award have, award have to specifically state that it's a lease and an off-taker? It's an award of a contract is the term. Yeah, um, okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, and then I think we have time just for one last question and apologies that we haven't been able to hit them all. Um, um, but the next and final question is going to be from uh, David Hyman. Um, I'll unmute you. Hi, a uh, couple of questions, both related to section 20.082 and three. Uh, first one, uh, probably quick. It looks like the difference between two and three seems to be the provision of, quote, being served by a smart tariff. Uh, is that the only criterion or is there something else? And what does that mean? Yeah, as we mentioned, thank you, um, David. As we mentioned, uh, you know, we are the the third provision there is really looking and seeking to uh, provide uh, AOBC behind the meter. As we stated in the uh, uh, announced or in the update that went out last week, um, we are applying the number three to non-net metered facilities. We're looking to make that further clarified um, um, through the regulatory rulemaking process. Okay, and the other question is uh, on the formulas uh, in two and three, kind of look at them carefully and I'm wondering about the uh, the form the transport distribution, transportation and transition charges. In two, if I look at them carefully, they seem to be measured in dollars, whereas in three, they seem to be measured in dollars per kilowatt hour. Why the discrepancy or is that an error? Mm -hmm. Now, I appreciate that feedback. We'll certainly be taking a look at that. Um, and as, as Caitlin noted, you know, these uh, 
these the this method is and the calculation method um, is uh, a matter that does need to go to a DPU for approval. So we'll be looking at that closely throughout that process. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Um, as uh, Caitlin mentioned, you know, uh, apologies again that we weren't able to get to all the questions that that came in. I think we got to a good chunk of them. Uh, we hope that this has been helpful to you. Um, um, to further clarify uh, areas of the regulations. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, to the extent that you have further questions on these, uh, um, you know, feel free to uh, email us um, when it comes to uh, policy implications and directions on, on where we should go. We certainly would uh, highly encourage you to uh, attend the public hearing next week on Friday to uh, voice those uh, um, perspectives as well as just supply us with written comments. Um, so uh, thanks again, everyone for attending and uh, look forward to hearing uh, further from you next week.